Vincent Tabak has been found guilty of the murder of Joanna Yates. A jury decided by a majority of 10 to 2 that he did intend to kill the 25-year-old architect when he strangled her in her flat last December. Joanna's parents said they hoped every minute of it is a living hell. Many killers have a signature way of killing their victims. They either use a knife or a gun. But there are some killers who go beyond these two weapons and are vile in their acts of murder. Those tools were mostly in one's proximity, and it was unthinkable for many. But what made these weapons so deadly? Was it the killers who used them, or the tool that brought uncertainty to life? Can you imagine what these weapons might be? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook where we shed light on under-the-radar cases across the country. My name is Matt, and today we are looking at the most unusual murder weapons ever used. Let's jump into it. 33-year-old Derek Burdo lived with his wife, Shanelia Harris Burdo, in Forest Hill, North Texas. For many people, they seemed like a normal couple, but there were many marital issues within. To solve their marital issues, they saw counseling from the Reverend Danny Kirk Sr. of Greater Sweet Home Missionary Baptist Church. For many weeks, Derek was at ease with his wife. Then, the relationship seemed perfect, but another issue cropped up in their relationship. Derek had mental issues where he would get paranoid about his wife's whereabouts and become more aggressive in his nature. So they went back to the church for counseling, and later Derek was sent to the medical center for help. But the help didn't last long, as it got worse for Derek. On October 29, 2012, Derek Burdo rammed his car into Greater Sweet Home Missionary Baptist Church and beat up Danny Kirk Sr. with an electric guitar that was kept in the church music room. The Reverend died on the spot, and the cops used stun guns in order to restrain Derek. When the cops arrived and put Derek in the van, they found no pulse on him, and he died the same night as the Reverend. What made Derek lose his temper with the Reverend? Shanelia Harris Burdo said that he was paranoid and believed that someone had drugged him. Upon investigation, it was clear that Derek had been drugged with PCP probably by the Reverend himself. PCP had an adverse effect on him. But what makes PCP so dangerous? PCP is a hallucinogenic drug that causes mood disorders, paranoia, hostility, and physical strength. An unimaginable electric guitar became a tool and weapon to kill a person. But this next one brings an unassuming terror all its own. In northwest Florida, there lived a couple, Monica Gooden and Darius Johnson. They were in their early 20s and were nearly in a good relationship. They even had a baby who had died prematurely. And like the baby, the bond between the couple was dying too. Over a period of time, Darius felt a sense of pestering from Monica's behavior. She would often control him and say no to things he liked. Then came a day when Darius had it all. On Sunday, March 31st, 2013, Darius picked up his Xbox 360 console and killed his partner Monica Gooden at home in the 2200 block of Northwest 55th Terrace in Florida. Monica's body was discovered after he was caught attacking another woman, Geraldine Price, at a nearby apartment in Lauderhill. The cops found a bloody Xbox console and three knives near the body. From then on, the case got interesting. When the cops intervened, he said that killing someone born under Taurus's astrological sign was the only way to set his soul free. But to your surprise, Monica wasn't even a Taurus. It was clear that Darius had mental health issues and wouldn't act on curing himself. A lot of it stems from that, which resulted in the brutal death of his partner, Monica Gooden. Darius was charged with burglary, double murder, and assault, and was sentenced to life in prison. From a console being a deadly weapon, 
we now move on to the next unusual weapon that caused a lot of trouble for a family. Darnell Alvarez and Daviana Blake were married in their 20s and they had a son. The family was small, but the plans weren't. To the rest of the neighborhood, they seemed like a normal family, but that wasn't the case at all. It was clear in the family that the patriarch was the one to discipline. Whatever he said would be the last word, and that got toxic within the family. And it caught on early. In 2013, Darnell Alvarez of Phoenix, Arizona, beat his two-year-old son with a belt as his mother, Daviana Blake, failed to act, fearing Child Protective Services. What could the little kid have done to deserve such a gruesome fate? The two-year-old wet his bed and was getting disciplined for that. That, of course, wasn't the only time. He was hit twice in the morning for wetting his bed, twice in the afternoon for defecating in his underwear, and later in the evening, which resulted in his death. The boy had bruises from the beating he got, which led to internal bleeding and a lacerated liver. On interrogation, the wife, Daviana Blake, said that she didn't intervene because she didn't want to upset her husband. The parents were set to jail for child abuse and first-degree murder. And if you think filicide has only one face, wait for the next one, where a baby was choked. China Arnold was born on March 29, 1980, and had a criminal past. There were a series of incidents that followed the act of filicide. She was convicted of abduction in 2000 and of forgery in 2002. After all the cases, China Arnold moved in with her boyfriend, Terrell Talley, in Dayton, Ohio. They were living partners. In their 20s, they had children, and Paris Talley was one of them, born in August 2005. But there was a problem. Terrell Talley wasn't ready to take responsibility for the child. He also refused to believe that he was the father of the child. Terrell Talley was an infidel in the relationship he had with China. China Arnold knew of this and later took the life of the infant. On August 29, 2005, when China was intoxicated, she placed her baby in the microwave for over two minutes when her boyfriend wasn't at home. The baby had died due to a high temperature. The baby had no external injuries, but did have internal ones. The baby was taken to the hospital and was pronounced dead. This act of filicide not only devastated the family, but many others living within the vicinity. What was more troubling was that the father of the child was ready to blame the neighbor's kid for the said act. It was still hard to digest what these parents subjected their children to. China Arnold is currently serving a life sentence. An unusual case and an unusual weapon that destroyed an infant's life. And this next weapon is as bizarre as the case. In April 2006, 29-year-old Patricia Ann McCollum was killed at Ravenwood Apartments on Old Kings Road. The killer was 61-year-old Jimmy Hackley. But how did he do it? It was his sweatpants through which he strangled the lady so vigorously that the blood vessels in her eyes burst. It took some time for the 61-year-old to do the act, but somehow he managed to do it. Jimmy tied Patricia up with a pair of pajamas and choked her with sweatpants. Before the murder, he had called Patricia several times, and that was how the investigators could connect him to the case. Moreover, Jimmy's relative also testified that Jimmy had shown up at his apartment looking distraught and asking for a ride out of town. The police found DNA evidence at the crime scene, which later resulted in the arrest of Jimmy Hackley. Jimmy now faces a life sentence. From sweatpants being a weapon of strangulation, we now move on to socks, which became a crucial part of the murder. Joanna Yeats was a landscape architect from Hampshire, England, who lived with her partner in a large house in Bristol, England. She was really good at her profession and had many projects to her name. And to celebrate her success, 
she went out with her colleagues on the 17th of December, 2010. And after that night, she had gone missing. There were many media reports and rumors around this case as it was heavily televised for the masses. After nine days of searching, on December 25, 2010, the police found the body in Fayland, North Somerset, England. The landlord, Christopher Jeffries, was arrested and later released, but was vilified by the media. It was heavy duty for the cops as there was media pressure, public pressure, and a lack of willingness in their act. There was another man, an occupant of the third flat in the same building, Vincent Tabak, a 32-year-old architectural engineer. He was arrested on January 20, 2011. After two days, he was charged with the murder of Joanna Yeats. The prosecution had enough evidence to prove that Tabak was the murderer and his trial started on October 4th, 2011. Everyone had one question in mind. What exactly went down? Tabak killed Joanna in her apartment within minutes of her arrival. Tabak was tall, so he used all of his strength and might on her, forcing himself by pinning her down. He later dumped her body in Phelan, North Somerset, England, which the cops found on the 25th of December, 2010. Tabak's DNA was found on the back of her knees, and he was sentenced to life in prison. All this time, the media had a major role to play. They became the outlet for the said crime, and many viewers were subjected to voyeurism. But where does the sock come into the picture? Tabak used the sock that she wore to suffocate her and then strangle her. He later kept the sock with himself while the media trial was going on, up until his arrest. A sock took the life of a talented woman, but there are more unusual weapons on the list. Edward Benson and Katie Benson were an old married couple in their 60s. They had a normal family with seven children and grandchildren who looked after them, but they preferred to live alone in West Milton, Ohio. The couple was in a stage of life where they were content, but that wasn't the case in its entirety. In the early hours of May 22, 1991, Katie Benson was beaten with a banjo in the head, and the second one was used after the first was destroyed by her husband, Edward Benson. Edward was charged with aggravated murder and was being held in the Miami County Jail. Katie Benson suffered massive injuries and later died while on the way to the hospital. It was a gruesome act by a family man. He was a banjo player in the Blue Cross Band. There were no concrete reason as to why Edward would hit Katie. There was no history of domestic violence, only that they lived alone and the neighbors were well aware of them. The banjo made the act gruesome, and with the next weapon, it is quite horrific. The use of toilet lids as a weapon of murder has been a tool for film directors to show anger wrapped in violence for the characters of mob bosses. But in this case, it isn't the tool of cinema nor the tool of anger. It is rather bloody. In 2006, Marvin Joseph Hill, a 49-year-old pizza delivery man, used a stun gun to disable the 29-year-old Christina Jeanette Eubanks when she turned down his sexual advances. He then assaulted and murdered her by bashing her head repeatedly with the lid of her toilet seat. While on trial, he said that he dragged her from her apartment using a dog leash around her neck in Fort Sanders, Knoxville, Tennessee, and then dumped her body wrapped in a carpet in North Knoxville Creek. Marvin was sentenced to life in prison from the toilet lid, we now move on to a pickle jar being used as a weapon. Daniel Kovar Basich was 12 when a 55-year-old man, Dwayne Hurley, approached him to take care of his dog while he ran an errand. Little did the 12-year-old know that it was the beginning of his grooming session. The parents were concerned at first, but when they found nothing on the 55-year-old, they let their son spend time with him. To their surprise, Dwayne Hurley offered to help the family when they were in a slump. 
The parents were extremely shocked to discover that on January 20th, 2010, Dwayne Hurley was murdered in their very home by their son. Daniel Kovar Basich smashed a pickle jar on the head of Dwayne Hurley and stabbed him 55 times until his knife broke. The victim was seen in a storm of anger. It was later found that the 55-year-old had been sodomizing the 12-year-old for a while. Dwayne Hurley was a pedophile and the officials found child pornographic material on his computer. Daniel was sent to house arrest and was later released. After the deadly use of the pickle jar, we now move to a crucifix as an unusual weapon. Karen Walsh was a 45-year-old pharmacist in Newry. She was well-to-do and had a two-year-old son. Marie Rankin was an 81-year-old Catholic living in Newry. She was orthodox. They would often cross paths exchanging pleasantries with each other. Marie Rankin would often tell Karen to be responsible and make an effort to take care of her child. Karen couldn't take the constant nagging that Marie passed on. On Christmas Day in Newry, Marie Rankin was beaten with a crucifix and was sexually assaulted. That day, Karen was drunk and angry. She lashed out at her with a crucifix that had been given as a wedding gift to Marie Rankin. The degradation further extended to Karen removing Marie's clothes and sexually abusing her. In the court of trial, Karen Walsh showed no remorse for the incident and neither did she explain the reason for the said crime. It is hard to imagine how humans can extend their thoughts and act as evil as they can. The next weapon is a jump rope, which makes it even worse as a weapon of murder. In the Bronx lived a five-year-old girl, Monique Fulgum, with her grandmother, mother, aunt, four siblings, and several other cousins. It was a joint family of mostly women in a building on the seventh floor, and it was all good until a sad day arrived. The five-year-old girl was strangled, assaulted, and later hanged using the jump rope in her bedroom. All of the aforementioned crimes were committed in an empty house on the seventh floor where there were no men present in the apartment at the time. It was six in the evening when the baby's grandmother discovered the grisly body of her granddaughter hanging unconscious from the closet door. The five-year-old was found dead while she was being taken to the hospital. The case is still unsolved. As gruesome as it can get, the next choice of weapon is a frying pan. Nora Peterson lived with her partner, Michael Milcherik, in Elgin. The couple was well-to-do and had a pretty good relationship. But it wasn't as easy as it seemed on the surface. The couple would often argue over petty things. And one fine day, Nora Peterson struck her boyfriend with a frying pan over an argument that the couple had had. She hit him multiple times in the head. After the hit, he fell and then stopped breathing. Nora herself called the cops, and the scenario was then explained. It was later discovered that her boyfriend was hit with several other things. Nora was sentenced to jail for 22 years for first-degree murder. After the frying pan is used to kill, there is the fireplace poker, which acts as this tool of murder. In 2013, a burglar broke into a farmhouse to steal valuables. And when he was caught, he used the fireplace poker to hit the owner of the house. His intention to steal was fulfilled, but his unintentional killing led him to kill the other two. Meet Jaron Kuster, who was charged with three counts of first-degree murder and burglary. After killing the owner of the farmhouse, he waited and killed the other two siblings later that evening. The bodies of Dean, Gary, and Chloe were all found by the police. The two brothers had multiple blunt force traumas to the neck and head, while Chloe had multiple blunt force traumas to the head along with stab wounds. He was sentenced to life in prison. And now we move to the last murder weapon on this list, which already seems deadly. Esteban Castillo and William Vasconello were good friends living in New Jersey. They would often work out and talk about life beyond being bodybuilders. 
But one fine day, Esteban Castillo was in a heated argument with William in his apartment in Patterson, New Jersey. Esteban used a 25-pound metal dumbbell and hit his friend multiple times until he died. He was charged with aggravated manslaughter. Esteban Castillo faces 15 years in prison, and to this day it is unclear what they were arguing about. A friend, a baby, a son, and a relative were all lost in these cases, and the choice of weapons used was all in proximity. We here at Mysterious Hook hope that no such cases ever happen again. So what are your thoughts on this? As always, please share your views in our comments section below. Also, check out our other videos at Mysterious Hook if you would like to see similar cases. We will be back with a new one soon. Thank you for watching our video, and if you found this interesting, please like the video and subscribe to our channel.